Hey, what's up everybody? How's it going? It's Burke, aka Dan's Great here. Welcome back to another boss guide. This time we're going to be talking about the species conquest in the monster arena. So those of you guys that are already following on, uh, you know the drill. Just check the timestamps in the description and uh, check out whichever boss you are interested in. But if it's your first time checking out one of these boss guides, the way it works is uh, I give you guys a rundown of all of the bosses in a particular section of the game. Uh, I tell you about like their, their move sets, their weaknesses, all that kind of stuff, and give you some tips and tricks on how to defeat them. And if there's a specific boss you're after, the information will be in the timestamps, so you can go and check that out there. Before I head into this one, um, I'm going to leave in my previous description of when I think you should take on uh, the monster arena in terms of stats, because you might be wondering, am I strong enough? Am I too strong? So I already addressed this in the previous video, so I'm going to keep that in, and we will continue on with our boss guide with the species creations. Let's talk about when should we be taking on the Monster Arena bosses. This one is totally subjective. All I can do here is share my own opinion with you because everyone has their own idea of when they think is the best time. But for me, and what I did in my commentary walkthrough, which worked out pretty nicely for me, was to complete the story, uh, to capture all of the, the monsters I needed to capture to unlock everything in the Monster Arena. And then once I did that, to take on as many of the Monster Arena creations as I could without having to grind or without having to do any stat maxing before I started with that stuff. Everyone is different. Something you might not know is that a lot of these monster arena creations have been defeated with no sphere conditions. So if that's what you're into, you can even mess around with that. But I mean, if you're that hardcore, you probably don't need to watch this video anyway. But just to let you know that it is possible. Final Fantasy X is that kind of game where it gets too easy very quickly. So it can remain challenging, but if you tip it over the edge, then bosses start to become pushovers. So what I wouldn't recommend is to is to max your stats, have 255 everything, and then just go in and blitz everything out because, uh, it, like for me, that's not my idea of fun in a video game. I like to be challenged at least a bit. So the way I do it like this, if you complete the story, uh, do all of the monster capturing, and then take on the monster arena, most of it will still be fairly easy, provided that you're well prepared, but there will be some of them that will be super challenging and will probably need you to boost your stats a little bit before you can defeat them. So I think it strikes quite a nice balance between, uh, you know, not killing yourself in terms of difficulty, but not making it a pushover either. So that's when I would get going with the Monster Arena battles. Another reason why it's a good idea to start after doing the monster capturing is because you're going to get lots of nice loot while you're going through Spira capturing all the monsters. You're going to make a fair bit of gill, and with the loot that you get, you're going to be well on your way to making some really good armors. Now, I have a really detailed uh, video about ultimate armors in the Final Fantasy X walkthrough playlist, so there's no point in me discussing uh, which armors are best here. But in simple terms, you're going to be getting 99 Dark Matters for capturing 5 of every fiend in Spira. Now, I would use these 99 Dark Matters on making your first Ribbon Armor, and I would give that to Riku, because she's got the mix ability as well. She's going to be the, the kind of jack of all trades, keeping everyone together, especially at lower levels. I think it's definitely nice to have Riku be the first person that you start setting up this ultimate armor for. In my own walkthrough, having one Ribbon Armor was enough, so I gave one person Ribbon, and the other two had Stoneproof, because to make three Ribbon Armors does take a lot of time, and for the Monster Arena, it's unnecessary. You won't need to get through it. Even the Dark Aeons, you can get by by just having one person with Ribbon and the other two with Stoneproof. So if you use those 99 Dark Matters to make one Ribbon Armor, you're going to make your life a lot easier in the Monster Arena. So that's something I would definitely advise. As for the question of which weapons should I be using, I would recommend the Celestial Weapons. Again, that's what I did in my walkthrough. Uh, if you get the Celestial Weapons for the characters that you want to use in the Monster Arena, that will make your life a lot easier because they can ignore defense. There's only very specific situations in which uh, customized weapons work better than the Celestial Weapons. The Celestial Weapons will be all you need for the Monster Arena, for the Dark Aeons, and for Penance. So I would definitely advise uh, attempting these battles with your Celestial Weapon. If you have good abilities on them, like Evade Encounter and that kind of thing, it's still going to be okay. You'll still be able to get through, but you're going to make life much, much more difficult for yourself. If you can't break the damage limit, then these bosses are going to take a long time, because even the worst bosses have like 120,000 HP, and that's like really on the low end. They average between like 300 to 500,000 and even higher once you start getting into species and original creations. So Celestial Weapons, I would say, are the way to go. As for other advice I can offer you before heading into the Monster Arena to try and fight these bosses, I would definitely recommend having Attack Reels for Waka. That can really help you out when you're in a pinch. Um, I think in my walkthrough, Waka has something like 118 strength, 
and he could do around 250,000 damage with attack reels. So I don't need to say any more than that. That makes life a lot easier for you. So attack reels can really help you out if you're struggling. Uh, make sure you have items to mix Hyper Mighty Guard and Trio of Quad 9. So Gambler Spirits, these are the kind of items you'll get for monster capturing anyway, but just make sure that you're able to mix those whenever you need it. Um, having something like Auto Haste is going to be very useful. Once again, uh, the items that you get from monster capturing, you'll be able to make one Auto Haste armor. Again, you can combine that with Riku's Ribbon armor, so you can give her an armor with Ribbon, Auto Haste, Auto Phoenix, and Auto Protect, and that's already going to be her ultimate armor ready. So add in Auto Phoenix into the mix, and you've got yourself a pretty formidable setup. So Auto Phoenix, some form of haste. If you don't have Auto Haste on everyone, it's okay. It'll probably take you a little bit longer, but I mean, you can give, you can use Haste Gur and Haste and that kind of thing, Chocobo Wings, Chocobo Feathers. You can get by without it, but it would be nice to have Auto Haste on everyone if you can. And finally, don't underestimate the value of things like Cheer and Focus. If you're struggling to survive against certain attacks, using Cheer and Focus can reduce the damage that you take from physical and magic attacks by up to a third. And by that same token, it will also increase the damage that you do by about a third if you use it five times. So don't be afraid to use Cheer and Focus if you find that the enemies are overwhelming you. And just as a final, final, final thing, you're going to receive 99 Stamina Tonics. If you're at the stage where you're, you're at like 3000 HP, 5000 HP, that kind of thing, at the start of every battle you can always toss a Stamina Tonic, get everyone up to double HP and start to set up your defenses with Protect and Shell and Cheer and all that kind of thing. And that way you'll be able to survive pretty much all of the attacks that the area creations have to offer. Once you start getting to the original creations, they're going to be too powerful, you're going to need much, much higher stats to survive. But for the area creations, with about seven to 8,000 HP, so if you double it from 3,500 and protect, shell, maybe defending sometimes, you can pretty much survive every attack that they can throw at you. So Stamina Tonics will definitely be your friend in the monster arena. So there we go, that's my preliminary advice before we get involved. Let's check out these monster arena creations and see what they're all about. Okay, so first up we've got Fenrir, and you can tell from the HP and how much you need to overkill it that this is a step up from what we were dealing with previously in the area conquest. So, it has weaknesses, uh, it's got magic break and mental break, but to be honest, you're mostly gonna be dealing physical damage at this stage, so it's not really that important. What you need to know about Fenrir is that he's gonna be hard to hit because he's got very high evasion, and for most people at this stage, you're not gonna have terribly high um, accuracy and luck, luck being the more important factor here. So you're probably going to have a tough time hitting this guy early on if your stats aren't too great. So this would mean that probably the best way to deal with it, if you're at low levels and you're just finding that you cannot hit it, you've tried to cast aim five times, you've tried to use a character that has the most accuracy and it's just not happening. So if that's the case, then I would go for overdrives here. Uh, overdrives are a surefire way to hit it because its magic defense is very high as well. So perhaps maybe a mental break and a magic combination might also work, but I mean, when you're talking 850,000 HP, magic doesn't always tend to be the most efficient way to deal with things. So, uh, as for Fenrir, what can it do? Uh, it's only got singular attacks, so that's good news. It's very unlikely that it's gonna be able to take out all three of your characters at the same time, because it won't be fast enough to do that, and it's only got singular attacks anyway. So, it's got three attacks. Fangs of Chaos is gonna be the one you're gonna see most often. Uh, it's a pretty annoying attack because unless you've got Confuse Proof, it will confuse you and it takes away 93.75% of your current HP. So there's a silver lining here because it only takes away current HP. That's very important. It's not maximum, it's current. So even if you're down to 1 HP, the attack itself will not kill you because it only takes away current HP. What happens here is that for any given turn, there's a 66% chance of Fenrir making a particular decision or using Fangs of Hell. Now this decision is based on whether or not any of the targets are confused. So basically, if no one is confused, there is a 66% chance of you seeing it use Fangs of Chaos on any given turn. Now if all of your characters are confused proof, then what will happen is 66% of the time, you are going to see Fangs of Ruin being used. So that's basically how it's gonna go. It's either gonna be Fangs of Ruin or Fangs of Chaos. That's the decision that it makes and a decision will be based on whether someone is confused or not. So that's 66% of the time. 33% of the time it's gonna use Fangs of Hell. Now Fangs of Hell is, as its name would suggest, a very annoying attack. 
basically the death effect if you notice on the notes there it says always so it doesn't matter if you have ribbon it doesn't matter if you have death proof there is no way you can stop your character from being KO'd by fangs of hell so that's really frustrating but you know it's just something you have to deal with so auto phoenix or trying to make sure that a character always has a turn after um, after Fenrir's. So, you know, if you're going to notice Fenrir getting two turns in a row, try to do something to make sure it doesn't get two turns in a row. But, I mean, even if you've got kind of middling agility, so fairly low-level agility and some form of haste, you should be fine. You should be able to keep up with Fenrir without too much issue. So, Fangs of Hell, 33% of the time, is going to kill somebody. There is just nothing you can do about it. But once again, there is good news. Of the three attacks that it uses, Fangs of Hell is the one that you can evade using Evade Encounter. So if all three of your characters have Evade Encounter, you will never get hit with Fangs of Hell. So that already takes away one of its attacks. If you all have Confused Proof, that's two of its attacks that's removed because you're not going to see Fangs of Ruin. And you also have to remember the fact that Fangs of Chaos only hits the character with the highest strength stat. So you can turn that character into a tank as well. So think about it, of the three attacks that it does, only one of them is actually going to hit anybody, and that attack only takes 93.75% of current HP. So when you put all of this together, use your overdrives if you're struggling to hit it, that is how you get through Fenrir. Next up we have Ornithalestes. I've never known how to pronounce this, but I've done my best there. Another one that has quite a bit of HP, 800,000 that we need to take out here. Uh, it's only got two moves, it's only got Poison Touch and it's got Drain Touch and it depends, the, the usage rate depends on how much HP it has. If it's got over 50% of its HP, more often than not you're going to see Poison Touch and you're going to see Drain Touch fairly minimally. So this is good news because Poison Touch only takes 75% of current HP. So if you've been following on from Fenrir, it's actually a less dangerous attack than Fangs of Chaos because Poison is something that we can deal with a lot more easily to confuse and it takes 75% of current HP, not 93.75. Poison Touch is not really that important an attack, I mean it's not going to cause you too much trouble. Uh, of course it goes without saying that for this is something that you can do for every single battle. If you find that with something like Poison Touch you're dying, like let's say it's doing 12,000 damage, try to make sure that you always have Protect on your characters. Uh, if you find that even with Protect you're dying, then just see how your agility is doing and if you have a chance make sure that you're either using sentinel with somebody or you are defending before the attack comes. So if you're in a position where you've got protect, you're defending as well and it's still killing you then you're pretty much too weak. You should probably come back when you're a little bit stronger because if you're not a very experienced player and you're too low level then it's very difficult for you to get out of that situation. So that would be my advice for that. So once you bring it down below 50% of its HP, then the roll switch. Drain Touch starts to become more of a priority and you start to see Poison Touch less. Now, Drain Touch is a powerful move, I'm not going to lie to you. Unless your character is a fairly high level, you are going to die unless you've got Protect. So again, with this one, just try to maximize your chances. If you've got Stamina Tonics, use them. Get your people up to Quad 9 HP if you can. Uh, get that Protect on there as well. Get Sentinel if you can have it and try your best to survive because it's only one character at a time auto phoenix will take care of it or even if you don't have auto phoenix you just have to revive people manually but one way or another you should be okay against this guy because it's only got two attacks one of them doesn't kill you anyway most of the time and drain touch even if you can't survive it it's only one person so you can always revive them as you can see here in this video so it's killing me with drain touch auto phoenix kicking in and reviving that person without too much issue. If I wanted to, I could, you know, I could double their HP up. Uh, I could use Hyper Null to reduce the damage by about 30%, but also Fiend's just quicker. I don't really need to mess around with overdrives and all that business. Uh, as a bonus, if you want to uh, zombify one of your characters, Drain Touch will actually damage it, and that's a, a tactic that you can use to be extra cheeky and to make it kill itself even more quickly than you are. So using that very tactic, I was able to defeat this thing using Riku only without ever activating anything on the sphere grid. So Riku can take this thing down solo just because of that little detail about zombification damage from Drain Touch. Let's talk about Pterix. So you're noticing that HP straight away, only 100,000 HP. But let's say your characters are very low level and you're having a very difficult time hitting it. As you can see, my characters here, even those guys, they're missing 
you know, as you can see, maybe about 70 to 80% of the time they're missing. So the opening attack will be Beak of Woe. Uh, it will hit everybody uh, one by one, as you can see here, and it will cause Curse. And it's it's a pretty powerful attack. I mean, uh, if you're not defending for it, it can kill you if you're at pretty low level. So that's how it will open the battle. And then based on uh, whether or not anyone's outside of Curse, it will use its regular Beak attack, which will cause a strong delay. So for this guy, I mean, it's got such low HP that it would be silly of me not to say that the easiest way to defeat this thing is just to use a multi-hit overdrive like attack reels or something like that. That is the easiest bit. But if you don't want to use uh, overdrives, then you're probably better off just um, being patient, uh, using aim, and seeing if you can hit it. And if you can, then you should be able to wear it down over time because it's just got such low HP that it will not be able to keep up. If Beak of Woe is causing you too many problems, you're constantly getting hit with Beak of Woe, don't bother trying to get your characters out of Curse. So try to set yourself up so that you can survive Be Beak of Woe, that's the most important thing. So that would involve obviously protecting, defending, uh, if you really need it, to start the battle with something like Hyper Null, and provided that you can survive Beak of Woe, you can kill it even without having to use uh, your overdrives. Because if everyone is under Curse, it's not going to bother using Beak of Woe and then it will only kill people one character at a time. So then that will make the battle easier for you so you won't have a constant triple attack going on. So the only time this battle can really start to become difficult is if you keep dying from that opening Beak of Woe. Provided that you can survive that, then the battle is yours. It shouldn't be too difficult after that. Next up we've got the Hornet. So HP is back up into the many hundreds of thousands range, 620,000 in all. Uh, this one has three different stabbing type attacks. It's got the regular one, and even though I call it regular, it's actually far from regular because it causes death 100% of the time, so you do need some proof protection to stop it, or if you have death ward, you'll be able to stop it 50% of the time, and it's got sleep, dark, and silence 80% of the time as well. So lots of nasty stage effects here from Hornet. Um, it's also got Venomous Stab, which you need poison proof for if you want to stop it, but I've never considered poison to be hugely problematic unless everyone gets it at the same time. Like, characters getting poisoned one by one, I feel that's never a big deal in the game. Uh, it's got Bewitching Stab, which has infinite chance of Confuse, so you need to have Confuse proof for that. That could be slightly more problematic, but again, I wouldn't like make a huge deal out of it. So how does Hornet's AI work? Well, if it's about 50% HP, uh, if the characters have no stasis effects on them at all, it's split 33% for the three attacks, so there's a third of a chance of seeing any of those attacks. But if it does use the ones with a specific name, so Venomous Stab and Bewitching Stab, it will use those on the character that doesn't have the status. So if you've got one person who's already poisoned, you know that that character's not going to get hit with another Venomous Stab. So if everybody's poisoned, then the odds of it using its regular attack go up to 66, so you'll see it two thirds of the time. And if everyone is confused, again, two thirds of the time. So you can basically see, I mean, the more people that have poison and or confused, the more chance you have of seeing that even more deadly regular attack that has a death effect as well. So provided you have the status protection, you should be fine. If anything, rather than leaving your characters alive and confused and or poisoned, it might be better to just have them die, because at least that way you know that you've gotten rid of their status effects because we have yet another boss here that only attacks one character at a time. So that's the that's the bonus there. But just don't keep people with stasis effects for too long because if you do, then the odds of you seeing that regular attack will go up. Now, when he's below 50% HP, he's got a 25% chance of using Kuraga, which is really weird. Like, why would a boss that has 620,000 HP use an attack that heals itself about 7,000? That just seems a bit ridiculous. But yeah, uh, don't need to go into like the, the specific percentages for the rest of the moves. It's pretty much the same, but the odds of you seeing any one of those single stabbing moves goes down because there's a chance of it using Kuraka now. But it's not difficult to hit. Interestingly enough, even though uh, Pterix, Ornithalestes and Fenrir are all quite difficult to hit, and this one is a flyer, it's actually surprisingly easy to hit. So that 620,000 should not take too long because you won't be missing as much as you were with the other guys. So you should be fine. Just a final note before we move on here. Uh, usually when you're poisoned, it does 25% of your maximum HP per turn. But if this guy poisons you, it does 67% of your full HP every turn. So 
if your character is going to have a turn, make sure that you get rid of that poison status, otherwise they're going to take a lot of damage. Vidatu is the boss with the lowest amount of HP in the Species Conquest, and it only has two moves. It either uses Ultima or it uses Osmos. Let's say you're of lower level, and doing even doing 95,000 damage is something that's going to take a little bit of time for you. Well, 50% uh, of the time it's going to use Osmos anyway, so that shouldn't be too big a deal. But what you should be able to do is hopefully use Shell and use Focus as well. So if you've used a Stamina Tonic, you've used Shell, and you've used Focus and Ultima is still killing you, then it's probably time to break out Walker's Attack Reels and just go for it, or use Trio, something like that. But it shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, next up we have One Eye. Only 150,000 HP, so another one that's on the low end, but this one can prove a little bit difficult because it's got two moves, one of which is very annoying. So it's got a move called Shockwave, and that is the move it's going to start the battle with. So Shockwave is a magic-based attack, so you need to use Shell if you want to reduce the damage from it. Uh, it will inflict Slow, Confuse, Sleep, Dark, and Silence, and you will need Proof Armors to stop that. So if you have Ribbon, you'll be unaffected, but if you don't have Ribbon, you'll need individual proofs for those things I've listed, otherwise you're going to have problems. So here comes Shockwave. Even with Shell, it did about 3,300 damage to my characters, so even though they don't have that great magic defense, uh, with Shell it brings it down to bearable level. So I think if you've completed the storyline, provided that uh, you use Shell, you should pretty much be fine. Let's say you've um, made it through this stage. As you can see, what I'm showing you here is two different files. This file here has much, much stronger characters, but they didn't have Ribbon here. So if you don't have Ribbon, it is really nice if you don't have the, the status protection. But at the very least, get yourself Sleep and Confuse protection, and that way you should be able to stay alive once, uh, once Shockwave hits. So after that opening Shockwave, then it's going to have a little bit of a decision. It's going to ask itself, has Black Stair been used five times in a row? If the answer is yes, it will use Shockwave. If the answer is no, then there is a 75% chance it's going to use Black Stair on the target with the lowest HP. Black Stair inflicts Curse, and you will need a proof to survive that, and it's a pretty powerful attack as well, but it is physical, so if you use something like Sentinel, uh, or you've got some Protect, or you're defending with your characters, there's a good chance that you'll be able to survive Black Stair. But Shockwave is the real problem here, so make sure that you're prepared for that. Aside from that, it's not immune to Armor Break and Power Break, so you can use Auron's Banishing Blade to help you there. Okay, so at the start of the video I mentioned that some of these species creations are genuinely difficult, and this is the first of the species creations, the first enemy in the monster arena that I would call genuinely tough. So, Jumbo Flan has 1.3 million HP, but that's not the difficult part here. The problem is, is that it's immune to physical attacks and has auto reflect. So, most of the time, like I said, when you're doing big damage, you tend to use your physical characters, don't you? but it's immune to physical attacks. It's not immune to overdrives, as you just saw there with the, with the Waka, so that's something that you can make use of, but it does have very high defense, so your overdrives aren't going to do a huge amount of damage, so be prepared for that. Now, I'll talk about its moves first, and then I'll talk about what we can do to start battling it, and you'll see what the kind of things I'm doing on the screen as well. Uh, it's got the level 3 elemental spells, it's got Flare and it's got Ultima. They're the ones that's going to be important. Uh, Ultima is going to be pretty powerful. If you cannot survive Ultima, you're going to have a bad time. Um, again, you're going to need to have that double HP. Make sure you've got Shell. Hyper Null if you need it. So use Entrust to give Riku maybe two overdrives so she can mix twice. That's definitely going to help you out. Um, once you've kind of got established and you're not dying from Jumbo Flan's attacks, then we need to figure out how do we do damage here. The interesting thing is that it's not immune to slow. So anytime you want to do something to Jumbo Flan, you need to have Reflect on somebody and bounce off spells from it. So this is what I'm doing here, as you can see. Uh, one of the best ways to kill this thing is to bounce off powerful spells. So if you have Lulu's um, Celestial Weapon powered up, she's actually a prime candidate here. So one way you can do it is to double cast Flare onto whoever has Reflect and it will do pretty good damage. Obviously it totally depends on your level. If you're very low level then it's not going to do a ton of damage but uh, these guys I think they have about 
160 magic, something like that. I'm not 100% sure. It does about 40,000. So if I use focus five times, I'd get it closer to the 50,000 mark. So this is one way to do it uh, by reflecting double cast of spells and using copycat to, to minimize uh, MP drain as well. But there is a method that generally tends to work better in this situation. And I'm about to show that one in a minute. So make sure you slow it. Do take advantage of the fact that it's that it's not immune to slow. It's a pretty slow boss anyway, and when you slow it down as well, that buys you plenty of time to set yourself up, heal up, and do damage. So that's one of the main things. When it's got over 650,000 HP, so that's 50% of its HP, uh, it will either use its level three spells, so the, when you add it all together, there is a good chance of it using one of the four elemental spells, uh, and there is a smaller chance of it using either Flare or Ultima. Now, when it drops to between 25 and 50%, then it's going to make a decision. So if anyone is under Reflect, then it will either cast Regen on itself, so it will bounce Regen onto itself. So it's pretty smart. If you try to use Reflect on it, it will heal itself with stuff like Regen. But you can dispel it pretty quickly, so it shouldn't be too big an issue. But just be wary of that. Once you bring it below half halfway, it will start using stuff like Regen and Kuraga. Kuraga is not a big deal, but Regen will be quite a problem. I mean, when you've got 1.3 million HP, Regen heals for quite a bit. So it will either do that, or it will use Flare or Ultima. Once it goes below 25%, so you're getting near the end of it, then the chances of it using Ultima go up from 25% up to 50%, and it no longer uses Flare. So it only uses the big move once you get close to the end. Gotta watch out. That's pretty much what you need to know from the AI side of things, but when it comes to what is one of the most efficient ways to, to kill Jumbo Flan, uh, if you're finding that your characters are just incapable, you're just far too low level and it's just not possible, uh, one of the primary ways to defeat it is by summoning Anima. So Yuna is about to summon Anima now. Uh, this Anima is a pretty powerful one, but it doesn't need to be supremely powerful in order to, in order to defeat Jumbo Flan. Now the trick here is that um, Anima's pain attack is not a physical attack, so that means that it will be able to do damage. Now depending on how you set things up with your characters, you might need to do a few little extra thing things with Anima. So you can teach Anima some extra moves like you know haste, reflect, protect, shell. Uh, if you're planning on using Anima in the long run anyway, you're going to need to teach um, those moves anyway. So I would definitely recommend doing that. Now. As you can see, it's not going to be able to da damage Anima too much, especially if your Anima is of a decent level. Now, the key is to make sure Anima can survive here and hit Jumbo Flan with those pains, because that is going to be one of the best ways to do it. Also, uh, Jumbo Flan drops Magic Sphere, so if you're into the whole uh, Sphere Grid maximization max stats business, you are going to need those Magic Spheres from Jumbo Flan. There is no other way to get it, unfortunately. So, if you want that overkill, that um, you know quintuple nine damage pain is one of the best ways to get it because uh, from magic I think with flare I don't think it's possible to, to hit 99,999 damage with flare so pain is probably one of the best ways to do it in this situation you probably noticed there that it did the whole uh, regen trick so it bounced regen off uh, onto itself just got to make sure you dispel that as soon as possible because that healing will add up very quickly if you're not careful. So there we go. I think that's pretty much all I have to say on Jumbo Flan. There's one of two ways to do it. Uh, the first way is to double cast Flare, use Copycat to, to minimize that MP and just keep spamming that magic. Uh, the second way is through Anima. So one of those two methods should hopefully be enough to take down Jumbo Flan. But uh, it might take a little while, especially if you're quite new to the game, you're trying to fight it for the first time. It will be difficult, but um, don't get too stressed out. It's supposed to be quite hard, but I'm sure you will find a way through. If it's, if it's proving way too difficult and you cannot survive uh, its ultimate attack, for example, like no matter what you do, you can't survive, this might just have to be one of those battles where you have to come back when you're a little bit stronger or when your anima is a little bit stronger. So I'll leave you guys with that. Have fun fighting Jumbo Plan. It definitely is one of the more fun battles in the Monster Arena. Next up we have Nagar Elemental and this one is another one that has over a million HP, so 1.3 million in all. Uh, it's got a very similar moveset to Jumbo Flan, it's got the level 3 elemental spells, it's got Flare, it's got Ultima, 
It's also got Reflect, but it's got a few extra tricks. It's got Drain, Osmos, and Bio. So the good news is that you won't have to deal with a regen type thing here. So, uh, in the notes you will see a counter condition. If Nega Elemental is targeted with a physical or special damage type, including overdrives. So I fired off an overdrive here just to show you. Uh, it will counter with Ultima. So this is one of the most annoying things about Nega Elemental. It has a pretty powerful Ultima attack. So these guys are quite high level. Um, and there you go. So they took a shitload of damage there. So you have to be really, really careful. This is another one of those battles where magic is probably the best way forward. Because obviously, as you saw, you know, overdrive's not going to work. Physical attacks, you're going to get hit with the ultimate as well. So unless your magic defense is very high and you can survive those ultimates without any issue, I probably would recommend against going for the physical attacks here. That being said, if you're fighting Nego Elemental for the first time and you're trying to, to figure things out, I would say try your best to see if you can survive it first. So, um, as mentioned before, obviously the shell, uh, using focus fire times, all that business, try to put that into full effect, double your HP and see how you get on. Uh, as you can see in the notes, there's something interesting here. So, if Nego Elemental does not have Reflect, it only uses Reflect, Drain or Osmos. So if you constantly keep dispelling it when it has uh, Reflect on, then you are not going to see that level 3 magic, flare and bio, which is quite interesting. So it doesn't use Ultima as a regular attack, so that's an important distinction to make here. It's only a counter attack, that's when you see it. So I just put Shell on my guys and they died again. So I would need, for, for my level of characters here, I would need to have... Um, shell and I would also need to use focus five times to guarantee survival and these guys you know they're still fairly low level but I've done the story uh, I've captured 10 of every fiend so I've got around you know Omega Ruin, Sin, all that stuff so I've still gathered a fair few levels but even for those guys it's not enough so that ultimate is very powerful. Let's talk about how we're going to damage Nego Elemental without having to deal with that annoying ultimate counter attack. Well one of the most interesting ways to, to deal with it that I uh, personally used in my walkthrough was to only have one person in the party. So that one person in the party needs to be uh, Tidus in this case because he's got the weapon that counters magic. So I left him in the party and I just attacked with counter attacks because if you hit him with a physical counter attack, it will not reply with Ultima. So if your attack is a counter attack, then you're safe. So that's why I ended up doing I just ended up having uh, Tylus there and he could survive uh, all of the magic because it doesn't use Ultima regularly anyway, provided that you can survive everything up to and including Flare, then your single character, all they've got to do is use some X potions maybe, uh, keep themselves healed up and just deplete that HP by counter attacking. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to uh, cast Reflect on one of your characters. So if um, if Nega Elemental has Reflect, you can either just dispel it, or if you don't want to bother with constantly dispelling it, you can just cast Reflect on one of your guys, is to use the whole double cast and copycat method. So um, Lulu would be a good person to use here because she will have the, um, the the magic booster. If she's got a fully powered up Onion Knight, she'll be able to do the most magic damage out of anyone. Um, the best thing to do would be to have Lulu in the lineup as well. Everyone hasted up as well. Make sure that you can survive uh, those spells that it's going to be hitting you with and just double cast flares onto it all day long. So Ultima if you'd like, but because Ultima's animation is really long, I prefer to cast flare. So just have people double casting flare, have the first person do it, and then anyone after that just use copycat because you'll conserve MP that way. So either counter attack with a person who has a celestial weapon that has magic counter on it, or just use double cast flare in order to do lots and lots of damage. So if you stick with it, it might take a little while, but you will wear it down and kill it eventually, I hope. Okay, so the last couple of bosses were a little bit complicated. This one is not so complicated. The Tanket has 900,000 HP, so still a nice healthy amount of HP, but its AI is fairly simple. So let's talk about it a little bit. Um, it is not immune to armor break, so if you have a frag grenade or you use Auron's Banishing Blade, you should be able to deal with it, no problems. Uh, its normal attack will cause Berserk, you need to have Berserk proof in order to not get hit with it. 
uh, its normal, its other attack called Rush Attack has pretty much exactly the same effect. The only difference is that it's a rank 1 attack. So they look exactly the same and they have the same strength and the same stage effects, but that rank 1 will make a huge difference. So if it hits you with Rush Attack, it will strongly delay the person who it hits, but because it's rank 1, it will get its own turn very quickly afterwards. So you will be shocked at how quick Tanker is when it uses Rush Attack. Its second turn will come back so quickly, as you can see here. So my guys have um, have haste, and you know their agility is not too bad. But when it uses Rush Attack, it gets its turn back very, very quickly. But uh, as with a lot of bosses, it has the same problem of only being able to kill one character at a time. So it should not be too much of a problem for you guys. Just armor break it and wear it down. If you really need to, just have one tank who has Protect, Defend and uses Sentinel as well to take the damage. Okay, here we go. Uh, the last one was pretty simple and we come back to another one that's a little bit more complicated here. Fafnir has 1.1 million HP, so another high HP customer here. Uh, it's got only two real attacks, but um, they cause problems. So its normal attack is just a simple physical one character attack. It's the one that you've seen a billion times before. Uh, it will start off with the regular attack. It will always target the character with the lowest HP. Now, once it's done that, it will use triple attack 1, which will be the ice element, then triple attack 2, which will be the fire element, and then triple attack 3 with the thunder element. So because you know which order these elements are coming in, you can either use a null spell to null all of the elements, or you can use the appropriate armor if you so wish. So there is a definite order in which it will use the triple attacks. So triple attack itself, what's the deal with it? Well, uh, triple attack is a bit of a problem because it is another rank one attack. So I spoke about rank one attacks in Tanket, but in case you skip that one, I'll quickly go over it again. Rank one attacks are extremely quick, so it will get its turn back very quickly. It's like a quick hit, but you know, it's, some, it's a quick hit that the enemy can make use of. So. When it hits you with that triple attack before you've even really had any time to recover, it's going to be using the second triple attack. So pay attention here to the kind of things that are happening. It's pretty powerful. Um, your characters could die from this. That's why being able to shield from the element is so important. So you've got to remember to do that. If you're not shielded against the element that he's using during the triple attack, there's a good chance that you're going to die. But look how quickly that attack came the second time around. I barely have time to recover. So you have to be very careful. In terms of how you're going to attack it, it's not immune to any of the breaks, so again, Auron's Vanishing Blade is a great way to go here, or one of Riku's uh, more damaging mixes will also work. Armor Break is a great idea for this guy to, to do maximum damage. Power Break will also be very helpful, because it will have less chance of killing your characters with that triple attack. And if you put those two together and make sure you're protected against the elements that is firing at you, you should be okay. So what's going to happen here is that once it's finished using the Thunder version of Triple Attack, the next move is only going to be a regular attack. So watch this. Uh, we've got the Thunder one here. But you can see the speed here. It's just uh, it's really like problematic. Okay, so now here, the next move you're going to see there is not going to be a Triple Attack. So if you look at the CTB, that next move is not going to be a triple attack, so I'm going to get plenty of turns after this. So this is the best window that you have to attack. This is when you want to unload. If you've got overdrives, you know, you've got big weapons, you've got big moves, whatever the hell you want to do, this is when you really need to do that damage to Fafnir because you're going to have a nice time window. When it's in that triple attack groove, when it uses those three triple attacks back to back, you get very little time to recover unless you're like really high level and it doesn't really matter. But for the lower level peeps, this is where you need to get your attacks in. So get that armor break in very early at the start of the battle, and this is the place where you can really unload on it. Sentinel again comes in handy. Sentinel is such an underrated ability, like most people don't really use Sentinel enough. This is one of those bosses where Sentinel can really make a huge difference. So that's also another thing that you can use. So yeah, protect against those elements, make sure it cannot kill all of your characters at once while it's doing triple attack. And, you know, even if you're really weak, you'll only have to recover one person at a time. So you should be able to wear it down once you've got armor break on there as well. And power break, of course. And, well, when in doubt, there is always attack reels. It never fails. So that should hopefully help you take out Fafnir.
let's talk about Sleep Sprout. Sleep Sprout is an interesting one. So 98,000 HP, once again, it's in that zone where you can kill it in one attack, even in no sphere grid conditions. So I can't really say much about its HP, but let's say you don't want to go that route. You actually want to do something a little bit different. Um, we can talk about its moves. It's got the three elemental spells, Flare and Ultima. We've seen that combination a few times. But the attack to note here is Good Night, which you're about to see right now. It inflicts Berserk, Poison, Power and Armor Break, and Sleep. All infinite percentages, meaning you need proof armors to protect against all of them. And you can see, when you have Berserk, it causes problems, man. If you're asleep, and you're Berserked, and you're poisoned, it's just horrible. So, yeah, Good Night is something that you don't want to be seeing if you can help it. If you can't avoid it, if you do have to see Good Night, then you're going to want to make sure that you have at least Berserk and Sleep Protection. At least that way you can kind of survive. But you will have Armor Break as well, so you need to dispel yourself as quickly as possible. So the counter condition is if Sleep Sprout is targeted by a physical attack. Now, I said before, but overdrives do not count as physical attacks, they're special type attacks. So you can unload overdrives on it without having to deal with Good Night as retribution. So, I mean, this thing's practically asking for you to just go in there and use attack reels and destroy it. So, there's no good reason why you should be struggling against Sleep Sprout, because you can use your overdrives without any penalties, and, you know, it's only got 98,000 HP. How bad could it be? Coming up, we've got Bomb King. So, 480,000 HP is on the lower end compared to some of the other things we've encountered so far. It's only got three different moves, so I count fire spells as one move, so it easily uses fire, fire or fire aga. It's got the, the kind of rolling attack and it's got ultima. The only thing you need to pay attention to in this battle is the number of times you've hit it and what stage it's in. So I've laid it out in the notes, but let me just go over it anyway. Uh, stage one, it only uses fire. Stage two, it uses fire aga. And stage three, it uses ultima. So if you attack it three times, it will hit stage one. If you attack it three more times, stage two, and then three more times, ultima. So it's like a, a three, six, nine system. Now, the only one here that is really gonna cause you problems is of course, ultima. It's got a pretty powerful ultima attack. So you do not really wanna be uh, dealing with that. So do be careful. Keep it in the lower stages. Now, how are we gonna keep it in the lower stages? Well, one way to do it is again through counter attacks. Uh, if you use counter attacks, it will not grow. So that's also very important. So if you set yourself up so that you have weapons that either just have evade and counter or that have magic counter, keep him in the stage that you want to keep him in. So if it's magic counter that you've got, get him into a stage where he's using Fyra or Fyraga and get some elemental protection for that and just counter attack him. It's a very easy way to get through. So that's one of the best ways to do it. If you don't want to go that route, then, I mean, I would get it to the Ultima stage. Do as much damage as you can. If it's an Ultima that you cannot survive, now watch this Ultima that's coming in right now. It's, uh, it's no joke. 13,900. So if I had Shell, I would have survived it, but I didn't have Shell, I wasn't ready for it, and I died. So, um, if you cannot survive that Ultima, then the best route to go is counter-attack route. If you can survive the Ultima, then you pretty much don't need to worry anyway. It's going to be too easy. Just have Shell, um, Hyper Null if you really want it, double HP, all that business. But that's about as bad as it's going to get. Just save all of your overdrives and your big moves for when it hits stage 3. And hopefully it shouldn't last too long. But yeah, it's, it will. There is always a chance that if you come in unprepared and you don't know what to expect, it can take you out when it's in stage 3. But now that you know the secrets of Bomb King's AI, you should be fine. Juggernaut has 1.2 million HP and has a very impressive name, but unfortunately I've always found this one to be really easy, like I always thought this would be one of the more difficult ones, but it always turns out to be quite easy. So let's start with the fact that it's not immune to any of the breaks. So Banishing Blade is always a nice way to go. Those of you that don't know, Banishing Blade will inflict all four of the breaks, so it's a really sweet ability to use. So. Either use one of Riku's more deadly mixes or use Banishing Blade to get all of the things that you want to get. Now, as for its attacks, um, it will begin the move. It will begin with a charging move. So it's pretty slow anyway. 
and it will waste its first turn by charging. So by the time it even uses its second move, you would have had a ton of moves already. What is the second move? The second move is Salvo. Now it's a magic attack and it's fire based. So you know what's coming. All you have to do is protect yourself against fire and nothing will happen. And it would have wasted its two first turns. And that is already going to give you maybe like 20 turns, 30 turns to, to just slaughter it. So most of the time, Juggernaut never really lasts that long. Uh, as for its attack, its attacks are pretty powerful. Um, you know, even if even if you can't survive them, it's only one character, so it's not a huge deal. These guys are very powerful. They have about 160 defense, so that's why they're so um, able to survive. Lower level characters will have trouble with it, but Crash Spike has a death element to it. You have to have death proof, other, otherwise you will die. But if you're weak, it's not going to matter because the attacks are going to be too strong for you either way. But all you've got to think about is, you know, you're gonna, it's going to waste its first two attacks. Then it's only going to be able to kill one person at a time. And um, once it's used Christ Spike four times, then it will go back to the whole charging salvo thing. So it will waste two more turns after that. So all you have to do is survive four Christ Spikes, which you will do very easily if you have some Phoenix Downs or you have Auto Phoenix. Then you'll get another big window to do as much damage as you like. So that, for that reason, unfortunately, Juggernaut is a is a bit of a is a bit of a disappointment if you ask me. I would have I would have liked Juggernaut to have been a little more difficult. He's got 1.2 million HP, but I think at the end of the day, it doesn't really count for much. It's quite an easy battle. Okay, my friends, here is the final and possibly most difficult enemy in the species conquest. Ironclad has a full 2 million HP and does require maximum damage for an overkill. Now you're going to be farming HP spheres a lot if you're into the whole stat maxing game so you're going to need to kill this guy over and over and over and over again. So let's talk about Ironclad. Uh, his weaknesses are armor, magic and mental break so you can't power break him unfortunately but you can armor break him which is a big deal and it's something that you should definitely be doing because 2 million HP is not going to get rid of itself. In terms of its moves it's going to use Shinryu Dan which is physical on one character it's got Bushinzan, which is physical but on all characters, so that's like the Reaper move. The trouble here is that it will take away HP and MP, so it will drain all of your MP. You have to be really careful of that. Uh, if you're able to survive all of its attacks, three stars would be something probably that you want to use in this battle, otherwise you're going to have to get through a lot of ethers. Uh, the other attack is a simple Repageki move, again physical, one character. So in this, uh, in this battle, again, stuff like um, Protect, stuff like Sentinel, stuff like cheer it's all going to be your friend double hp all of that good stuff ultra null or hyper null or whatever you want to use so that's all going to be very helpful in terms of what it does uh, its attack pattern will be repageki so the normal attack it will use bushinzan the the bad one that's the attack that could wipe out your entire party if you're not careful and then shinryu dan on the character with the highest hp so it's a pretty simple pattern but it's one that you have to make sure you're following because if you're if you're not careful and you don't realize that Bushinzan is what's coming next, if you're unprepared it could wipe you out, so you do need to be careful. The only other thing to note here is that it has a counter condition. Uh, if, you, if you target it, it will counter with Repageki and this Repageki is not going to be evadable. So that's something you have to remember. So of all of the attacks that Ironclad can use, the only one that you can evade with evading counter is the normal Repageki that it uses, so not the counter attack one just a regular one that it does. So what we can do here is remember the fact that Shinryu Dan is done on the character with the highest HP. So again we can kind of control that situation and make sure that we have a tank who can take Shinryu Dan every time and make sure that he stays alive. So there's certain challenge runs to make use of, of that thing as well. So in general just uh, make sure you get that armor break on it as soon as possible buff up all of your characters as much as you can if you're especially if you're weaker here you're going to need a lot of buffing uh, use three stars if you have them to to not have any mp cost in this battle sentinel is your friend because two out of the three moves that it uses is going to be single character so you can use that sentinel as a good tank um, and i think that's pretty much it once you've got that armor break on there you should be able to whittle his hp away but do remember to finish it off with a move that does maximum damage. So whatever that move is going to be, do you need to summon Anima? Do you need to use an Overdrive? Whatever it is, do it. Because 
if you're going to get HP spheres for it, you don't want to go through that entire battle and only get one HP sphere for your troubles. So if I were you, I would make sure that I finish with a big move to make sure I got that second HP sphere. So that's all I've got to say. That is Ironclad and that is the conclusion of this boss guide. In the next one, we will be dealing with the original creations and the original creations are a totally different ball game from what we've been facing so far. So the characters that you see here, um, I've not had to do any kind of grinding for this. Uh, this has just been kind of natural, doing the storyline, capturing monsters for the arena, all that kind of stuff. We managed to get them to this stage, but for some of the Monster Arena original creations, this isn't going to cut it. So for some of them, we can get through. But for some of them, it's just going to be way too difficult with the stats that we have here. So we're going to have to uh, work on our stats a little bit, get a little bit more powerful, and then end up defeating those guys. So join me next time for the next Monster Arena boss guide coming up very soon, where we will defeat all of the original creations and hopefully give you guys the tips and tricks that you need to be able to get through. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. Take care.